Business is today's roundtable on skills for sustainable growth in the 21st century. I'm Nadine Dereza and it's a great privilege to be chairing this roundtable discussion. I'm joined by a very esteemed panel with uh, plenty of experience. On my right is Raza Khan. Raza Khan is the Executive Director of NCG. Welcome to you. Now, NCG is one of the largest educational, training and employability organisations in the UK. Next to Raza, we have Vic Grimes, and he's from the National Apprenticeship Service, or NAS, as it's often referred to, and is their Divisional Apprenticeship Director for London and the South East. Now, to my left, probably to your right, is Dr Adam Marsh from the British Chambers of Commerce and is the Director of Policy and External Affairs. And Adam is also a veteran of the Business Today Roundtable series, having taken part in the last debate on pension reform. So a warm welcome back to you. And next to Adam is Phil Bonnell, who's Managing Director of InTraining, which is a national organisation, obviously related to our colleague over there, meeting the training and employability needs of employers and employees across the UK. And Phil, I believe you worked in central government, the third sector, and in private and public sector learning, employment and skills for over 25 years. So a huge wealth of experience. So welcome to you all, gentlemen. So the first question I'd like you to consider is that the government has prepared the groundwork for business and the further education community to take more responsibility in shaping future skills and vocational training in the UK. So is this the correct approach? And if I can start with you, Vic. Yeah, I mean, from a, an apprenticeship point of view, I think um, we, we've got apprenticeships now as one of the kind of central themes of the government skills strategy and really giving employers ownership of that programme because, as we know, in order to become an apprentice in this country, you have to be employed. You have to have an employer who's prepared to invest in your learning and skills. So I think by having a programme that's at the heart of uh, what employers do in terms of upskilling their, their workforce and attracting talent into their uh, organisations is, is absolutely key. Um, there's a whole other range of work that is going on in the sector. For example, um, high-level pilots, 25 million going into developing higher-level frameworks and apprenticeships, which is what we've been told employers are looking for in order to become incredibly um, uh, competitive. And that means creating 19,000 more higher-level apprenticeship places. Um, and then we have the employer ownership pilots, 250 million actually giving employers the responsibility for actually workplace training and giving them the responsibility for actually um, uh, funding uh, skills training in the workplace rather than the money going directly to training providers. So I think there's a range of measures that are going on that will certainly strengthen the apprenticeship offer and that can only be good for employers. So there, obviously there is a range of measures but Adam, do you think this is the correct approach? I think we would certainly support some elements of it. For example, employer ownership is a really, really encouraging path to go down. Basically saying to employers, all right, you said you're not happy with the system. Tell us how you do it differently. Uh, and we want to see the results at the end. Is a really, really good uh, experiment to take. And it's one that I'd hope we'd see expanded over time more through the skills system. Because unfortunately, what we do have really is a crisis of confidence, I think, amongst many employers in the country in terms of both the skill levels of young people when they come out of the education and training system and in terms of the qualifications that we've got at the moment. You've got huge numbers of employers who say, I just don't understand. They change every week. It's complicated. The jargon is tremendous, etc., etc. So simplification, clarity and greater ownership are all things to start to build confidence and change perspectives. And Raza, I know both of you will probably come from a similar perspective from NCG. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are looking for clarification, aren't they? Particularly young people and, and their parents as well. As an organisation, can you deliver that? I think we can. And I think the point of clarity is actually a very important one here. Uh, clearly, we welcome the uh, increasing freedoms, both to employers and to skills providers, to innovate and to drive forward an agenda which is about skills for employment as well as about skills for growth. That means skills for employment for young people entering the labour market for the first time um, and skills for growth for businesses that need to compete on an international scale. Certainly, I think freedom to innovate, flexibility at local level, flexibility for employers, flexibility for skills providers is the way to deliver that. Um, I think to enable that, um, clarity. Uh, we, uh, uh, we certainly see a complexity in the funding rules, complexity in some of the entitlements that employers have to uh, 
uh, you know, to access different uh, skills opportunities. And uh, simplification would help. Um, you know, certainly also, I think, uh, more freedom, uh, an extension, for example, of the uh, vocational and skills agenda to 14 plus, uh, which I know is mooted um, at present and we'd like to see move forward, I think will help to drive that, uh, you know, that agenda. So certainly freedom and clarity. And you, you mentioned about, the two key themes. You mentioned about being mooted at present, but there is a bit of controversy between when the actual point of vocational education should hit. I mean, Professor Alison Wolfe, if you look at her report, uh, I think it was 16, 80% of the academic side of the curriculum should be, sorry, should be academic, and maybe 20% should be more vocational and practical. So do you think that people have made that consensus yet as to when the entry point of vocational education should actually start? I mean, some people would say older, 18. That's right. Well, of course, we, uh, we're very experienced in 16-plus uh, uh, vocational education um, and, uh, you know, run a heavy emphasis on practical and operational skills, it, which actually embed a lot of the academic skills you've talked about as well. Um, so making an 80-20 split isn't always the um, most helpful way to look at things because, of course, uh, you know, 100% vocational um, education through an apprenticeship involves a very high quality of academic learning, um, you know, at levels two, three, and four as well, depending on the level of apprenticeship um, that you're uh, that you're into. We certainly advocate very strongly uh, the increasing flexibility for vocational um, providers and FE colleges in particular uh, to take learners directly at 14 um, into uh, you know heavily practical uh, vocational and business-based uh, courses, and in fact are opening a specialist school called a UTC, uh, you know, next year to pursue that agenda, and would like to see. Uh, you know, more flexibility for 14 plus vocational routes. And when you say UTC, you're talking about university technical, university colleges. technical colleges. And technical. just to refer to Professor Alison Wolf, if anyone's watching the programme and is not sure who she is, I did a review of vocational education as well. Now, Phil, I'd imagine you'd come up with a, a similar standpoint as we've just heard as well. Anything else you'd like to add to that? I think the, the, the clarity um, point that's been made um, is extremely important. Um, what we pick up from the ground in dealing with employers. Um, on a regular basis and we're, we're dealing with around about 20,000 employers per year um, so we're coming across quite a wide range of views there um, and it is that clarity over um, government policy, um, government programs, government services, um, the raft of rules around a variety of things that um, were there to actually make things a lot simple for them, to actually give them some solutions to actually their needs as employers. Uh, they're desperately seeking that clarity. And um, I think organisations um, like ourselves and, and working with other partner agencies uh, can actually come up with those solutions for employers, particularly around their recruitment and training needs. So let's consider now whether the current standards of vocational qualifications and apprenticeships are a high enough quality to benefit both the unemployed and employers. Adam, what are your thoughts on this? Well, the simple answer to the question, if it's a direct question, is no. Um, it's bewildering, <coughs> it's confusing, it changes constantly, as I said before. And we seem to have a very good uh, sort of line of work in this country in, in, in sort of very short-term changes to our qualifications frameworks because they suit political needs or political expediency of the government of the day rather than the longer-term economic needs of the country. If you look at some of our competitors, the Germans are the example that are very often held up, mm -hmm. the standards and the qualifications haven't changed for decades. They get tweaked a little bit from time to time, but what you don't see is a continuous reinventing of the wheel, and employers are very jealous of systems where you have that continuity, because whether the, the, the change to the qualification is better or not is almost immaterial, because the lack of continuity leads the employer to perceive that something has gone wrong, something is somehow devalued. So whether it's a perception or reality, you see this, this sense of a deterioration. You talk to employers about apprenticeships, for example. Many of them love apprenticeships, uh, and many of them have been some of their best advocates over the years. But what we've also seen is a lot of people saying, well, every government comes in, and to meet their particular numerical target, they've shoved everything into what they would consider mm. to be an apprenticeship. So it's devalued it for me, and I'm not sure if it gives the right signal for my business anymore. But no government has got it right, whereas maybe in Germany they have got it right, so that's why it needs to be tweaked. If you look back over the past, I don't know, three successive governments, no government has got it right. So don't you think it's right that they should make those changes? I, th I think we've thrown money at the, the skills system, public money at the skills system, over the past two to three decades in this country, and I don't think that we as taxpayers have necessarily had the result we should see. So yes, some radical change is needed, but I think my plea would be this one round of radical change 
-hmm. and cross-party agreement to then stick with the outcome so that we can actually see some results. Otherwise, all we're going to do is throw, throw it all up in the air again in a couple of years' time. Some new brass nameplates, some, some new deck chairs moved around the, the, uh, the uh, deck of a, a possibly sinking ship. Vic, I mean, obviously, it's your interest to support apprenticeships. NAS does that. Do you think, do you get a sense that this is the right direction now, that the, the cross-party are working together, you're formulating a policy that you are going to stick to? Well, I think if you look at when NAS was set up at, back in 2009, that was on the back of a, a review called World Class Skills and Apprenticeships and, and was actually backed by the previous government in setting up the National Apprenticeship Service to do two things, grow the number and volumes of apprenticeships, not just in the traditional sectors, but also across the non-traditional sectors, to ensure that the quality of the delivery was improved too. Um, and just in the time that I've been involved with the National Apprenticeship Service, we've seen um, success rates go from a low point of 25% of um, uh, apprentices starting the apprentice actually completing their framework to 76%. So, I think we are moving in the direction, uh, right direction, but I think it's always right not to take quality for granted because I think um, there have been occasions when new funding regimes have been introduced, new approaches have been taken, you have unintended consequences. Um, but we're absolutely clear that you know, you know, the strive for world-class apprenticeships has to continue. We have to look at new ways, new innovation, simplification, make it easier uh, for employers to understand what the benefits are and why it's important that they invest in young people too. That's really key. So going to 76% I think is good. We've recently published a 33-point quality action plan. Sounds so very long. It is long, <laughs> but I, I, I have to tell you that is working with a whole range of key partners because it's not just the, the National Apprenticeship Service, it's the you know, Association of Colleges, it's... Um, it, it's provider representative bodies, it's sector skills councils, it's Ofsted, it's Ofqual. There's a whole range of partners that can contribute to actually you know, creating a world-class offer to our young people and to our employers. So there's been in improvements. We've, with Biz, just conducted a, an employer survey and nine out of 10 employers are saying, sorry, 88% of employers who were surveyed are saying that from their perspective, apprenticeships um, are a good investment for their business. So a nine out of 10 uh, apprentices who have completed have said they actually found their apprenticeship actually really good. So there is value out there, but I think we need to improve and strive to improve all the time. Absolutely, it's that balance between, it's great having quantity, but if the quality slips, then the quantity is not so good, is it? The quality, it has to be rigorous. Um, what needs to be done, do you think, to drive up standards, Phil? I think there's a number of things that can be done to, um, to drive up standards. I'd, I'd agree with what, with what Vic says um, about achievement rates. Achievement rates certainly have, have never been higher in, in my experience uh, of apprenticeships and, uh, and they're currently performing at, at a, decent, uh, a decent achievement rate for, for framework achievement. Um, but um, certainly for young people, I think there is um, a need for more formal training. And I'm a mm. passionate believer um, in a return to something called off-the-job training. Um, you, you go back to the days of apprenticeships where there was a formerly a day a week um, off the job at a college, at a training organisation where a young person actually learnt the theory, the underpinning knowledge of what they were about to put into practice in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I believe um, that there is um, a greater need for a move towards that type of activity in the apprenticeship programme rather than just doing everything in the workplace five days a week and in some ways young people then just assuming they're just basically being accredited for things that they can do in the workplace uh, in general. So. But that doesn't sound necessarily hands-on and the whole idea is about being practical and vocational and it's trying to accommodate to those young people that university and academic life isn't suitable for and in fact it's those practical skills that shape our world in so many ways. The, it, it is, um, but I think, I think there's, there's a, a, a way forward in giving, people those, giving young people those practical skills um, in colleges, in training providers mm -hmm. before they enter the world of work as well. Um, so they're actually learning skills, um, learning skills before they actually enter, said, before they actually enter employment, and, uh, and then putting into practice those skills 
um, um, through the apprenticeship programme um, or through work experience. I think there's, uh, there's a great need for that. Okay. Ross, I'm going to come to the next question. Is the introduction of payment by results for training providers an effective way to meet the needs of the unemployed and secure jobs? And sort of a sub-question to that, is the extra funding that's now available being used appropriately in the sector? Well, I think this is an absolutely a key question uh, to this debate and one that uh, NCG is uh, actively involved in at the moment. We're one of the major providers of the work programme, uh, which I think is the largest uh, kind of experiment, if you like, in uh, payment by results for social reform anywhere in Europe, certainly uh, uh, in our experience. Um, and we are uh, you know, currently uh, you know, involved in uh, bidding for other projects under the payment by results framework too. Our position would be that payment by results itself is an excellent mechanism uh, for driving innovation standards and quality into difficult social reform programmes which have been, if you might, you might say, sticky in the past. Very difficult to make uh, radical changes in, in uh, employment uh, um, uh, support and, uh, uh, and in tackling unemployment because providers haven't necessarily had the freedom to operate um, you know, using long-term methodologies which work for them and which work for their, their customers. Payment by results, because it's usually attached to what the government call the black box approach, whereby the uh, provider is paid on their results and then given some operational freedom and flexibility to, uh, to achieve those results, uh, you know, we feel is working well for us um, in, uh, in the work programme context. We do feel, however, that there is a danger when payment by results uh, is linked to price-based competition. Um, uh, NCG is a not-for-profit organisation and we have bid honestly and uh, with integrity in every project we've taken on and we will never underprice uh, the work uh, and never um, you know, uh, bid below a value which we feel gives best value to the, to the customer um, since our primary motivation is not necessarily to turn a profit. Um, we do feel that by combining payment by results uh, with very aggressive price competition in some of the um, uh, expected future contracting, there is a danger um, that, um, that more conservative solutions will, uh, will prevail, uh, that quality will be sacrificed for price, and that payment by results will not actually deliver the results that are, that are needed. So huge advocates of payment by results, um, less convinced, I think, at this point of the uh, combination of payment by results and aggressive price competition for public services. We feel public services should be delivered properly and priced uh, and funded uh, effectively. Adam, do you concur with those thoughts? Um, I think it's a very interesting perspective. I come at it from a slightly different one, which is that of the chambers of commerce around the UK, many of whom are training providers themselves in their own right or who work with larger training providers. Payment by results for not-for-profit organisations that are of a smaller scale is an extraordinarily difficult thing. Um, you know, a lot of these organisations don't necessarily have the size of balance sheet that's mm -hmm. required in order to go in and say, you know what, I can, I can take my lumps during the course of this uh, contract and make sure I get paid for it at the end. And that is a really, really big challenge to overcome. And the reason why that's a concern to me is because very often, you know, Raza quite rightly referred to difficult social programmes trying to affect social change, quite often the local connection and the community connection is critically important. And that's where chambers of commerce have always played such a strong role because they understand both the local business community on the one side and a lot of the local learners and colleges on the other and can provide an honest brokerage role between the two. Sometimes for them they say, well, gosh, payment by results is a bit mm. too risky uh, and a bit difficult for us to really take on. Let's move on to the next question. And Vic, I'm going to bring you in. Um, with the utilisation of financial incentives, will they stimulate the expected response from the business community and have the appropriate effect on the development of skills in the UK? Incentives for business in difficult times are actually really important, particularly small businesses. And that's one of the reasons we um, have introduced the age grant for small employers who are, are being asked to recruit 16 between at the ages of 16 and 24 young people into their business as an apprentice and um, 30 million available nationally we think that will be an incentive 1500 pound for, uh, per SME uh, willing to make that commitment so I think yes there is a place it's it's the extent to which that continues over a period of time I, I think it's appropriate and many countries use incentives to business to actually achieve you know, whether it's a, a job outcome or an apprenticeship. Many countries have, have used that approach, but not necessarily in good times. And, and I think we just need to keep a healthy balance between SMEs really struggling right now in a difficult marketplace, 
high unemployment amongst young people, and that, that actually warrants an investment, and I think it's the right thing to do. So we're looking to generate at least 40,000 additional apprentices targeting 16 to 24 year olds through that incentive. Other incentives obviously is the contribution to the cost of training. We must never forget that. Full cost uh, for a, an apprenticeship aged 16 to 18 and a contribution of 50% 19 plus. Again, that's a massive investment from government looking to get those important returns. But it's not only just about young people as well, although they Absolutely. obviously need to be targeted. Um, there are investments into the older age group as well, and quite a few apprenticeships have been announced just tackling that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, many of the older age groups, if you take 25 plus, are, tend to be already in the workplace. And our view about that is that the employer really ought to make the investment in their existing workforce. We want, we, there's nothing wrong with 25 plus operating in the workplace. We, we would encourage it, upskilling. It makes the business more competitive. But where we want to emphasize our, uh, the government's investment is, is in our young people. Phil? I, I totally believe in financial incentives. Um, it's something that I've seen working extremely well in the past, um, and I think they have a place. Um, I think the current um, raft of financial incentives that are available to employers um, are confusing. Um, I think that there is very little marketing that's out there which raises awareness of the incentives to employers. Um, I'd like to see some evidence of the incentives that are currently announced through the youth contracts and, and, um, and, and other things. Um, the take up um, to date because personally I see very little take up um, um, of the grants with employers. Um, too bureaucratic um, and I think the marketing has been left to the providers to deliver. Yeah. Um, so all in all Great idea. Um, I'm yet waiting to see them take off. I can see Adam nodding. Even his chair's nodding. <laughs> my, my, my chair is nodding because I call this marketing failure, mm -hmm. which is effectively what we have. Quite often as a business organisation, we take the government's task for policies or interventions that we think are incorrect. In this particular case, it's not the policy or the intervention, in this case, an incentive that's incorrect. The problem is they don't do enough to tell people no. that it's out there. Uh, and by the time they wake up to that fact, they're busy changing it to the next yeah. thing. So we do as much as we can through Chambers of Commerce locally to try to say to businesses, hey, there's between one, sometimes two, two and a half thousand pounds available to you here, whether it's for taking on an apprentice, de-risking employment in the early months, uh, sort of substituting for the fact that you're putting so much management time in. We can explain it to them a million different ways. But until you hear it from the horse's mouth, as it were, from the government, in a lot of cases, the businesses simply don't respond mm. adequately. So I recognise everything Phil's just said on the signalling point. It's incredibly important. But rather, tack tackling SMEs, they're a hard nut to crack. I run a small business myself, and we have so many different things that we need to do as a small <coughs> business that we have very little time to look at adverts, marketing campaigns, or other external organisations, even though it might benefit us. So how can your organisation tackle SMEs to make sure they get the message through? Well, I do think there's two themes here. One is about clarity and one is about universality, you might say. I certainly think, uh, you know, and I would echo um, uh, colleagues' points, uh, you know, very strongly, a clearer message needs to get out there. Uh, because I do believe that for SMEs to take advantage of what's on offer, they need to know it's there, they need to know it'll benefit their business, they need to be able to... Uh, uh, you know, to access it. And I think that's both about communicating the message and actually making the funding rules and, uh, you know, uh, making the access to the funding less bureaucratic uh, and easier. I certainly also think there's a question here about universal access. Actually, when you drill down into some of the conditions and qualifications that sit around these, um, uh, you know, particular incentives, you might find you're very interested in taking on an apprenticeship. I'd love to do it. I'll go and uh, um, I'll ask my colleagues at the Chambers or, uh, or at NAS what to do, and I'll find that actually um, I don't fit within the category or the learner I want to, uh, to employ and then put onto an apprenticeship doesn't fit into the category um, for, this, uh, for this particular incentive. So I think providers are actually doing the best they can through the Chambers, through NAS, through our partnerships with local authorities and other stakeholders to get the message out there. The difficulty we're finding is that the message is quite, uh, quite muddled, um, and that actually it is, by its nature, a difficult message to get across because it means different things to different um, audiences. I certainly think the way to drive uh, incentives through the SME sector, uh, as I say, is a much clearer message to the sector and I think a much easier route 
uh, you know, to access this funding. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we don't want people, uh, you know, jumping out this willy-nilly into drawing down grants for learners that don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's much less likely to happen with the regulatory framework we have now. And I think we can relax the restrictions a little mm -hmm. to make the incentives and schemes that are available much more widely accessed by, um, by the SME sector. But easier said than does, I said SMEs, very tough market to crack. Next question, and Vic, um, this is really about the performance of your organisation. So I'm going to let you answer this first, and then maybe hear what That's the other very kind. <laughs> Charitable no, of you. Not, I'll let you then come back again afterwards on any other comments. <laughs> How successful has the National Apprenticeship Service been since it's created in April 2009? Well, I'll be quite neutral and say we're doing OK, I think. I, I, I think there's always room for improvement. But I go back to what I said earlier, you know, on the back of the Leach Review all those years ago, world-class apprenticeships. Um, we were set up to grow the number of apprenticeships and also raise the quality. And I think we've done both of those, you know, reasonably successfully. So, for example, we've got an additional 50,000 workplaces in England offering up apprenticeship opportunities. 91% um, increase in the number of apprenticeship starts across all ages. And a, and a a 49% increase in 19 to 24 year old start. So we are, we are focusing and doing as well with younger, young, younger people than we are adult apprenticeships. So that's all good news. Um, high success rates, 76% from a low point of 25%. 25 so all the indicators appear to be going in the right directions. And I, but I think there is so much more to be done. Um, and where we can add value, you know, we will continue adding value. But I think, um, for me, one of the most challenging um, tasks is really to grow the number of SMEs with apprentices. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the figures right now, only about 10% of SMEs engage with the apprenticeship programme. It's much higher if you're a larger employer. So I think we really need to look closely at how we can do that. So still probably early days for you and a very neutral assessment there. OK, <laughs> there's still a lot of work to be done, possibly. Um, Adam, I suppose in many ways, you know, the National Apprenticeship Service were bridging the gap between the two funding departments of beers and education. And, you know, one, do, one does wonder how closely those two departments work at times. Mm. Would it be more appropriate, do you think, to have bypassed NAS and then pass more responsibility and control onto local governments and their communities to begin with? Or do you think NAS has had its, has its place correctly within our society? I think there's a PhD thesis or three in the question you just <laughs> yes. asked me. So <laughs> what I'm looking forward to receiving it from you. <laughs> what, <laughs> what I'm going to do is to pick and choose bits of it. First of all, I'm going to deftly sidestep the bit about NAS, but put my foot directly into the chasm between biz and the Department for Education. Mm -hmm. you, you phrased it very well when you said there does seem to be a bit of a gulf between the two. I would, I would submit that, that gulf is extraordinarily wide indeed. And it's incredibly frustrating to business uh, because what business is looking for is constancy, uh, stability, clarity, and it's not receiving that. So I feel sorry for NAS and other organisations who are trying their best to bridge that gap at times, and I think it is a difficult job indeed to do. Um, on the question about local government and uh, local communities, uh, again, this could be argued either way. Uh, on the one hand, I've already said that it's good to see local community organisations like Chambers of Commerce and other local businesses with a very strong role in articulating employer demand and also in trying to control how funding is used in order to achieve the kinds of outcomes we want to see. And w w with all fairness to Vic, 76% pass rate for me is, is neither here nor there. It's the job outcomes to me that matter the most of all, whether the individual has a successful career thereafter. And to me, that's at the heart of success. I'm not sure whether local, uh, whether local authorities are geared up or equipped to do that. Um, I'm not sure that even with local partners together they're necessarily geared up or equipped to do that, especially at a time when they're focusing most of their attention on local education and local safeguarding because those, those are the core, and picking up the bins, those are the core things they have to do even at a time of, of relative austerity. So I think we could argue the toss on institutional arrangements until we're blue in the face. I think what a lot of businesses would like to see actually is some stability. So if we have a national apprenticeship service at the moment, okay, how do we make it work? How do we make the two core departments of state work better together? And how do we get those kinds of business and job outcomes we definitely want to see? Phil. I've got to be fair to Vic. Um, National Apprenticeship Service. Um, if you go on um, uh, the rise in achievement rates, big tick. If you go on the growth of apprenticeships, it's another big tick. Um, and that's the growth of apprenticeships across whether it's the 16 to 18, 19 to 24, or 25 plus. Um, 
how much it's had to do with the National Apprenticeship Service, um, I'm actually not too sure. Um, because once again, I think a lot of it falls back on the providers um, to actually um, drive the achievement rates um, of apprenticeships. And then we can look at ourselves and, and the growth of, uh, growth of achievement rates within uh, NCG and in training. Um, and we've had some, some considerable growth there. Or whether you look at the, the volume uh, of apprentices coming through the system. And um, a lot of the energy, a lot of the resource, a lot of the marketing um, comes through our organisation. And it's what we do ourselves on the ground working with our staff on the ground, working with um, local employers, whether it be SMEs or large employers, we're doing it, we're out there on the ground. And, um, and we tend to be doing it, to be honest, in isolation in most, of the, in most cases. And, and rather having an institution like, I say institution makes it sound awful, an organisation <laughs> like NAS, has that helped your organisation given the framework behind training, vocational, practical education? Has it driven the message through more succinctly well, I think there's two levels to that question. I mean, uh, you know, one is, um, you know, would it make more sense to have a national coordinating body like NAS um, or to pass more control onto local authorities? I'm certainly very in favour of a, a national coordinating body to oversee mm -hmm. the policy relationship between BIS, the education and the provider and, uh, you know, employer. Um, communities, uh, because it is true there is a gap between uh, you know BIS and uh, you know and, and the department, and uh, you know there's a need for a bridging mechanism between the two departments and from the two departments into uh, the community. Um, I think in terms of um, uh, NAS achievements to date, um, I think it's very true that we've uh, you know as uh, as Vic's mentioned we're seeing uh, you know a rise in the uh, the uh, volumes of apprenticeship and a, a rise in achievement levels. Um, I would say going forward that um, uh, you know, a closer working relationship between NAS and providers um, and a movement towards more freedom uh, to innovate at, uh, at local level um, and a less regulated, uh, more standards driven um, framework with, uh, with the control under the standards and quality agenda rather than necessarily the, um, you know, the detail of the frameworks themselves would be a useful way forward. So I think great achievements from NAS to date um, and I think a new chapter you know, to begin now to really push those achievements rates beyond 76% um, and to drive the next level of uh, enrolment onto apprenticeships because we all want to see more volume coming through the system. So Vic, I said I'd give you a response back to that assessment. What are your thoughts on what you've heard? Very quick response. Well, I, well, I think we, we, we do work alongside providers. Um, we do work alongside local authorities um, to, to support the overall effort of growing you know, the marketplace in terms of apprenticeships. and. Um, and as I said, we, we don't wish to kind of, uh, we, all we wish to do is add value. Um, we don't want to compete. In fact, 78,000 new businesses have come through NAS, and all of those have been referred out to providers and, mm -hmm. and colleges. So they are kind of receiving a benefit from mm -hmm. our interaction with the, the employer. For over 400,000 people have registered on our apprenticeship vacancies online mm -hmm. site. To, for vacancies and, and applied for vacancies and so we are matching up talent out there with employers. So there's a lot of things that, that go beyond just the 76% and the you know, 450,000 starts. We, we're doing a lot more beyond that um, that many people don't actually see. But it's adding value more than anything. Okay, finally, uh, the final question to consider is looking ahead and fostering the growth of the UK economy in the global market, what do you consider are the key areas that still need to be addressed regarding the delivery of skill system to fuel both opportunity and power prosperity? And bearing in mind, even everything that we're doing now, we could still slip down the skills table. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a huge danger when you think about those emerging economies. BRICS are often referred to Brazil, Russia, um, India, and you've got China, and also South Africa now thrown in as well, plus a whole heap of countries in Southeast Asia. I mean, what we have on our side is maybe that traditional educational system that we've got. But if we don't start addressing these issues now, we're going to slip down further. Adam, your thoughts, please. We are slipping as we speak. Uh, and sometimes our penchant for navel-gazing and institutional change <laughs> causes us to slip further. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, deluded ourselves into thinking that the fact that we provide a very good school and university education for about 30% of our population is going to be enough to assure our global competitiveness. Mm -hmm. But I'm probably one of the few Ivy League and Oxbridge educated people who spend most of his time arguing about the 70% mm -hmm. who didn't have 
that privilege or that benefit, nor necessarily ever wanted to go down mm -hmm. that route. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that we are not doing enough for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if we really wanted to put this into a succinct framework, it would be as follows. What businesses want, because they're the ones ultimately have to deliver the jobs for people once they come out of this skills system, is stability uh, and responsiveness to their demands when they articulate them properly. Um, and what they want to see, I think, is a three-pronged approach, really. They want the basic soft skills for work out of every young person, the responsibility of the education system and the responsibility of parents. Um, the second one is that they want apprenticeships and the sort of technical skills and, 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 and moderate to higher level skills that they need for growth, and especially in high employment industries where we have a lot of potential going forward. You think about demographic change, for example, as one area, greener technologies, you know, you've got loads of these areas where apprenticeships could play an enormous role in future. And then finally, of course, there's the specialist skills that we all need to see. And I'll point the, the, the lens back at businesses themselves for a moment. A lot of businesses need better management and leadership skills mm -hmm. so that they themselves can identify their future training and skills needs so that they don't complain on the day, I'm not getting what I need from the system, but they'll have known five to 10 years previously and will be doing something about it. Ros, it sounds like quite a big challenge to tackle then. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it is a big challenge. I think it's also an important one. It'll come as no surprise that uh, my first theme uh, on, uh, on this will be clarity. Uh, yeah, I've made that point several times. Uh, I think clarity and stability, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to pick up on, um, uh, on the interests of business too. Um, but these are important themes, and it's easy to forget how confusing to those outside the policy framework, uh, you know, the policy milieu that we all live in uh, can sometimes seem. So certainly, I think, a much clearer, simpler system of standards, qualifications, frameworks, and uh, funding systems uh, will help to drive standards through. Um, I think coupled with that, um, and again, it's a, a difficult thing to put forward, but investment. Um, you know, we, I think we would all welcome the clever and careful directing of public um, finances uh, you know, in, you know, into the skills sector um, in a way that does support uh, employers and business uh, to invest in the skills of their workforce. And this might involve uh, going back to some older ideas around wage subsidies, around subsidised employment, youth employment schemes, uh, you know, and other areas which take a bit of pressure off um, you know, a business sector which is already struggling to keep uh, you know, our economy in growth uh, and support them to, uh, to drive the employment agenda for young people. The third area for us really is about early intervention too. And we haven't discussed it too much in this theme. But uh, one of the hidden um, themes in the Wolf Report, which I think will come to the fore in the next year or two, um, is about a much more practical emphasis in education from 14 plus. Mm. Uh, and we'd like to see the breaks off um, in terms of uh, direct entry into FE mm. at 14 plus, uh, you know, uh, more access to uh, practical, vocational and on the job learning um, at 14 plus as well. And some of those recommendations in the Wolf Report really seeing the light of day quickly. And um, Vic, one thing we haven't discussed is the role of parents in all of this. I mean, you can put in place all these different policies, but if you haven't got parents on side, it's going to be very, very difficult to have the skills that the UK needs to properly compete in the global marketplace. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, parents are very influential. And, and one of the things that we need to do, I think, is rebalance the programme by creating pathways through the vocational route that can lead up to higher education. And the parents can see the real value of apprenticeships in terms of Get, uh, intermediate, advanced and high level and then on to higher education if that's appropriate for the individual. And I think what we re really do need to do as well is work much closer um, or encourage closer links between employers and local schools because employers are the best people to go in and talk about the opportunities that are within their industry and um, can talk about that with enthusiasm and actually bring in apprentices as well who can talk about it from their own perspective. So in, parents can be involved in that process. So I think parents are very, very important. Um, I just think we need to really work hard at demonstrating the value uh, of the vocational route against the, uh, alongside the academic route. And the cost, I think, to the parent is probably one of the most important influences in that process. <laughs> and also, at the end, you know, you're proud that your child is an apprentice just as they've got a degree, yeah. that's when you know that, you, that you've ticked the system and, you, and you're going in the right direction. Absolutely, and we should celebrate the achievement of an apprenticeship. You know, graduates, you know, when they graduate, my daughter mm. graduated and we went along, there was a big event, it was all robed up. Wouldn't it be great if we had similar arrangements for our apprentices who, who were graduating mm. through their high level or, or even their advanced? Mm. And I think, you know, ensuring that parity and demonstrating it is, is really, really important.
And Phil, final words from you again, considering the key areas that still need to be addressed in delivering the skill system to fuel the opportunity and also power prosperity. As a training provider, um, I actually can't achieve anything without the, uh, the buy-in of employers. And uh, we've, we've said it on numerous occasions um, today, what we're looking for is clear, cohesive, concise messages uh, to employers that they can understand the programs and services that are out there. They un can understand it, they can buy in, and by buying in, we will achieve more. Well, thank you very much to my esteemed and very experienced panel. I hope you've enjoyed that debate and looking at sustainable skills for the 21st century. And um, thank you and goodbye.